Did you know that studies reveal a staggering percentage of developers often miss the mark when it comes to writing clean and organized code using classes? Overusing inheritance, having a tight coupling among different classes, poor encapsulation, lack of proper abstraction are just a few examples of the pitfalls that we as engineers make on a daily basis. Okay, get ready to transform your programming skills and join the ranks of elite developers who master the art of class-oriented coding. I wanted to say that so badly. All right, uh, you are watching 100 GB and welcome to the ninth episode of the Clean Code series, where we will talk about, as you already know, classes, which will help you set yourself class apart from all the other engineers. Well, the pun was intended. Anyway, this series is all about this great book called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin. And this is effectively the third last uh, episode. All right, let's jump into the classes. What are classes? Classes, as we know, are one of the building blocks of how we structure and write the code. They are relevant for like mostly only for the object oriented languages that we have. And all the modern languages have support for objects in one form or the other, like even Golang or Rust. But see, that doesn't mean that you have to use classes. You can write a classless code as well. And actually, uh, I would suggest you to give it a try. Try converting class that has a significant internal state and a few methods manipulating that state. So your class can look something like this. Uh, you have a couple of internal like instance variables and then a lot of methods that work on manipulating those uh, particular variables. And it's even better if this particular class is being used at multiple, uh, multiple places and multiple objects of this class are being created, it'll be even better. And then just try to write a classless code and you will realize yourself that classes help a lot in organizing the code and improving the readability of the code as well. All right, let's talk about class organization. So uh, we already have a standard Java convention that the classes should begin with the instance variables followed by the constructors and then followed by the normal methods as uh, we call them. The author suggests more fine grained order. Uh, let's take a look at the location manager code from uh, the Android open source project. Okay, so this is really good code uh, in terms of the structure of the class and this is what the author suggests as well. We have the visible constants at the top which are effectively public static final uh, variables. Then we have the private constants which are basically the private static final uh, variables. Then we have the constructors. And then finally, we have the methods. And even with the with the methods, we generally have the public methods uh, on top of the private ones. But I think it's fine. You can blend the private methods because sometimes the method is very small and you need it just for one function. It makes sense to just put it below that function instead of like putting it uh, putting it after all the public methods. And in case you notice, then there is hardly any non-static variable which is public like if there is a public variable it is it is effectively a static uh, uh, static variable well and this is exactly what the book suggests as well there is practically no reason to put a public variable in a class which is mostly correct there, there is this other book effective java by joshua bloch uh, i hope i'm pronouncing the name right so that book goes one step ahead and says that a variable should be public only if it is purely immutable and final or in other words it's only readable so for I, which effectively becomes this constant so if a variable is uh, readable it's purely uh, it's totally fine to have it as a public variable which brings me to the next point, which is encapsulation. The entire motive behind this public private thing is encapsulation. The, uh, this is one of the purposes of the classes as well, that they hide stuff. They are complex in the implementation. They have very simple uh, public methods and they're super complex. And generally the users shouldn't care a lot of what's happening inside the class. All right, encapsulation, uh, any class related discussion is incomplete without uh, mentioning encapsulation. Location manager, again, is a pretty good example. So if you see, um, yeah, so location manager, it has a lot of code. I mean, just if you just look at the number of lines of code, it's like 3000 lines of code, and it's hiding a lot of complexity behind it. From the point of view of the app developers, they use this particular class to listen for the GPS location changes. And that's effectively what every app has to use. Like we 
Facebook, Instagram, Google Maps, and then they use this uh, location manager because this is a class which is inside the kind of inside the SDK, which uh, which is given to the app developers or which is available uh, for the app developers. And this SDK talks to the internal operating system services. Uh, so it hides all the logic, and you have very simple public methods uh, which the users can interact with, and that's what the encapsulation is all about. Hiding complex logic. The other thing mentioned in the book is that the classes shouldn't be small. Now, this is not a very good example of why classes should be small. So this thing actually has a couple of sub points that you need to take care of. Uh, the first one is a single responsibility principle. I am pretty sure you've already heard it. So it says that the, uh, that the class should be focused around just one concept. It should do only that one thing and it should do that pretty well. By doing one thing, I. I don't actually mean just one method. I mean the concept in general. Let's take a look at the code. Okay, so we have this beautiful payment service uh, class, which has a lot of methods. And if you see the methods, some are related to payment. Uh, I see some that are related to user for some reason, which doesn't make any sense. So uh, obviously in terms of single responsibility principle, we should ideally break it down into two classes. Let's move the user related functionality to a separate class that that is user service and restrict the focus of this payment service to just the payment related uh, functionality. It also kind of brings me to the next point, which is cohesion. So cohesion means something that is very closely related. Uh, when we talk about cohesion in a single class, what we actually mean is that we should strive for finding groups of methods or logic that is very closely associated and actually move it to a dedicated class of their own. Let us take a quick example in the same uh, payment service. So if you see, even now, there are a few methods uh, like generating the report, calculating the total amount paid, calculating average payment amount. So these are these look like either like utility methods or they look like some reporting mechanism uh, thing. They look like methods which are used to generate reports, which maybe are not very well suited for the payment service. So the next thing that we can do is we can actually group these methods in their own class. Now, it depends on us whether or not we need to create internal classes or we can actually create like right now these two are internal classes but they need not be they can actually be siblings to the payment service and it's not just about methods there will be uh, a lot of instance variables as well which might be related to just these methods so those instance variables will effectively come here uh, inside the payment calculation class and uh, this is like another way of making sure that your classes are very small so the more cohesion you detect the smaller and the smaller the code becomes uh, readability is boosted a lot because it's easier for anyone to understand. It's easier for anyone to understand the code if it's really small. Another benefit is that the tests become easier to write because then you just need a few common methods because you just have one concept, right? You don't need to come up with multiple fakes. Uh, so writing tests for a single class, it becomes pretty uh, easier. The next point, classes should be open for extension or closed for modification. So interestingly, I have touched this concept in episode six on the sixth minute mark. Uh, I won't go into a lot of details today. Anyway, we can still have a quick uh, example. So there's this, let's say there's this class called chessboard, which we are building a chess game and we come up with a chessboard class, which has the white and the black pieces. And there are a few methods to move the white piece or to move the black piece. And there is this method to reset the board. And then we have a game class. We have a list of moves that the players are making to undo the move if we want. And we have a reference to the chessboard. And we finally have this method, which is let's say called when a player wants to move a piece. Oh, when the player wants to move a piece to the new location, we uh, call the board to move the piece. And then when the piece is moved, we see if the player has won uh, given the current condition of the board, current state of the board. And then we play the winning animation. We record the uh, move as well. If you go to this method, in the board. Uh, so it says we update the position, we play the move animation to the new position. And if it is consuming a piece, then we play the consume animation as well. There can be some nice killing animation that we want to play. So things, things are very really fine here. Now think about this. So let's say you, you originally wrote this code for iOS, but somehow you want to write it for Android as well. Or let's say you want to move 
you now want to move to some cross platform way of doing stuff and your rendering logic or the way you the way these methods work just the animation part it differs from uh, architecture to architecture for android you might be using some other uh, mechanism or some other native libraries to paint on the screen for ios you might be using something else but let's say your uh, the main orchestration code is still uh, let's say in javascript or some common language which is understood by all the uh, all the platforms so what you will do is you will probably create a renderer so let's say the original code was just written for android and this is what you had those so all these methods are effectively being called on the renderer now it's even better if you had gone this uh, route instead of using an android renderer class or instead of using uh, the direct functions like these and these you could have had an interface which is renderer and then on android you could use the android renderer which is basically implementing that renderer and injecting it into your app similarly for ios uh, rendering you could create an ios renderer that implements uh, the same renderer and you don't need to change your existing code uh, yeah this is true that originally that the, this code should be using uh, let's say the chessboard should know about a renderer Yeah, so you see what I did there? The chess board in its constructor requires the renderer. It doesn't need to know what renderer is it actually getting. It just depends on the interface and uh, it calls these methods on that object. Okay, coming back to the open and close principle then. So given that we have written our code in this way, if we are to support a new platform so let's say you want to support desktop then the only thing that you need to do is you need to write a new renderer which is a new class and you don't need to change any code in the existing classes and that's what this open close principle means that the classes should be open for extension you can create new classes which depend on your existing classes and uh, there is no modification that is uh, that should be that should be ideally required in the future all right uh, the next thing isolating from change the very idea of uh, having this inheritance structure gives you the change isolation for free you know the bonus points here even your tests work like a charm let's take a look at the code we, we do the sorting a lot and you create this interface which is basically sorter which has a sort method which takes in an array and sorts it in place so today you just have the bubble sorter which uh, implements the sorter and do some bubbling in the future if you want to have an optimized sorter uh, this gives you flexibility to do that you create a new optimized sorter very similar to this and you implement your complex logic in this sort method so this is kind of isolating your sorting mechanism and making sure you can have like any kind of sorting mechanism in the future and that's what we mean by iso isolating the change and coming back to the tests so your even even for your tests your tests just need to use a sorter called the sort and uh, make sure that the sorting is still working uh, in the same way even if you come up with this with the new sorters you actually don't need to change the code uh, you actually don't need to change the test which is the best part the last part for today which is a favoring composition over inheritance so this is maybe another thing that you might have learned in school or college let's quickly take a look at the code okay so we have this a very classic example we have this animal uh, class which is abstract because making instances of an animal doesn't make any sense we have tiger which extends animal we also have a crow that extends animal now well ideally we should have some uh, maybe a bird class in between anyway so let's say you want to add the eat functionality which is pretty simple you add an eat eat method here and then you add uh, you override the method in every class things get tricky when you want to add let's say feeding behavior to the structure so uh, every animal should have its own feeding schedule or uh, dietary requirements and stuff like that now doing it in this form is kind of tricky maybe inside this method uh, okay when you're implementing tiger maybe inside this method you come up with some generic stuff or you create your uh, uh on the let's say the schedule 
eating schedule and uh, like all the information that you need you create it as part of your uh, animal class which again uh, is fine something that you can do with so eventually we will do something like this only but the fact is that this eat method is definitely appearing to be failing uh, this is the kind of the remedy that we have so you add a new let's say feeding behavior uh, inside of the animal class and this feeding behavior can be uh, customized by every every specific animal that we have now the fun part is that the feeding behavior itself can have can have its own state now this feeling there can be other feeding behavior specific to let's say either cat or uh, cat dog crow whatever but in a sense what we have done is we have moved away from depending on this inheritance that is overriding this eat method and doing stuff uh, uh, there and just moved all that stuff to a new class itself which which can have multiple instances depending on uh, depending on the animal at hand all right now you will ask okay gaurav uh, this is pretty usual stuff we have seen it in uh, school or college during our course uh, does it even matter does it uh, is it even used in real life well glad you asked okay let's go to the android open source code and see this interesting class so the name of this class is pip bounce algorithm uh, which is effectively the algorithm related to the picture in picture mode i'm pretty sure most of you are android users when you are using let's say youtube and you tap on your home button youtube goes to this uh, kind of picture in picture mode where it's still visible regardless of what you do on the screen Th that particular thing uses uh, uh, the this algorithm to calculate the new bounce and uh, i think the animation as well and this has this another algorithm which is the snapping behavior uh, the snapping is like where it should be snapped towards the corner of the screen uh, depending on a few um, uh, states i really mean, this particular algorithm could be modified depending on the form factor it could be android tv or anything and interestingly when i searched for this algorithm this is exactly what i got so Android TV uses uh, a customized version of this algorithm. And in the future, if let's say Android Wear or Android Automotive uh, need their customized PIP algorithm, they can just potentially have their own algorithm, uh, extend the PIP bounds algorithm. And this class still remains the same. And that 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 is why we favor composition over inheritance. All right, so this was all about this video, folks. Uh, there are just two more episodes to go, episode 10 and 11. They will be out uh, in the next, I guess, two weeks or even less than that. And I I hope you're liking the series. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And yeah, that's all. I will see you in the next one. Bye.